Hey everyone, and thanks for checking out another video. This is a little bit of a mixed bag. We're looking at the Appalachian Regional Port in Crandall, Georgia. We're about six miles south of the Tennessee border along US Highway 411. We'll check out the container cranes at work and learn a little bit about the facility. Then we'll head north to Etowah, Tennessee and check out the CSX yard there. We'll see just a little action in the yard before our final stop, the CSX yard in Corbin, or what's left of it. As you probably guessed, all these facilities are along the CSX mainline between Cincinnati and Atlanta. I captured this footage on a recent drive home from Georgia. I'll warn you right now, I had no luck on this trip catching any manifest trains along the way. All right, well back to our first stop, the Appalachian Regional Port. We'll watch these cranes and see how they operate. Because this facility is much smaller than the North Baltimore one, we can get a much better view and closer view of how these cranes and containers come together. We'll also learn a little bit about the site. Everything will be sped up. Now I'll admit it, I had no idea this place existed until I drove by and decided to turn around. This facility is a joint effort between the state of Georgia, Murray County, and CSX. The terminal is focused on providing a direct route to markets across the globe. Open in August of 2018, the port has the capacity of 50,000 containers a year, and the plan is to double that by 2028. It offers direct service to the Garden City Terminal at the Port of Savannah, 388 miles away. It has three electric cranes working three tracks. Containers can be stacked seven wide by six tall. Trains come and go every other day to and from the port. Like I said in my previous video showcasing the CSX facility in North Baltimore, containers really are the future. The Georgia port says container traffic is up more than 20% year over year. Real quick, does anyone know what those workers in the vests are doing? It looks like they're stopping at each well car and inspecting or doing something else. The three working tracks have a total length of 6,000 feet. Here we see how the trailers line up to load or unload a container. It really is incredible how they're able to keep track of each and every one of these. And just so you know, I'm off the property while flying this low. You can see a power line in the lower right corner of your screen. Those are actually next to the highway outside the facility. Here we see a container being lowered onto a trailer chassis. Let's see if we can get a better view of the crane in action. It was a steady stream of tractors in and out of the port. I'm curious how they keep track of where these containers are supposed to go, given that some of the drivers dropping them off may arrive earlier or later than when they were scheduled or expected. If anyone can share any info on this, I'd really appreciate it. Let's watch as the operator picks up a 20-foot container. This is in real time. You can see what looks like four pins coming out of each corner of the lift as the operator gently eases it onto the container. You probably can't see it because of the YouTube compression, but those are the locks which hold the container in place. They turn and then lock the container into the lift. I also just noticed there's a red light that turns green to let the operator know it's been a successful connection. Once they see that, the crane starts to lift. I'm curious what those things are extending out and over the corners of the container. That's pretty good aim, but we can also see the sides of the trailer chassis are tapered to guide the container where it needs to be.
You barely notice, but the crane does slowly creep backward to line up with the next container. And just like that, another container is on the move. I just noticed something though. This lift crane looks like it can only pick up these 20 foot containers. I'm curious why they would have made that design decision, or is this capable of picking up larger containers? Also notice that big wheel on the left side of the crane. That's where the power pickup is. And as the crane moves up and down the track, that will spin to give more cable or pick up the slack as it moves closer to the center. I believe the cable rests between those yellow tracks to prevent any kinking issues. This shot is looking north at the facility. Each one of those tracks is about 2,000 feet long. I think they must have called for a lunch break or something because two of the cranes have stopped operating. You can see storms brewing in the upper left corner of the screen. I didn't have much time before they would open up. As we finish out this shot, you can see the main line next to the facility. Let's take a closer look at where the operator sits. Also, I have my answer to my question. The lift cranes are actually adjustable to handle a variety of container sizes. You can see the numbers on the lift. As we pull back just a bit, we can see the large motors and spools on top of the crane that make everything go. Here we get an even closer look at how things work. You can see the red or orange light in the center indicating the lift is not connected with the container. And notice how the power cable unspools from that cone in the center of the lift to prevent the cable from catching. As the container starts to rise, we can see the light is now green.
Just after the container is positioned, the rain starts to fall. Here's one last flyby of the facility. This was pretty neat to catch, especially out of the blue like this. Unfortunately though, you can't really see much from the ground because there's a fence line of trees surrounding the property. I found this lot of trailers and container chassis across the street. I'm not sure, but I don't think those cranes are capable of lifting a traditional trailer, but I could be wrong. I checked the signals on the main line, and it was red in all directions, a sign of my day to come. All right, let's move on to the yard at Etowah. This is about 35 miles north of where we just were. It's also off US Route 411. A great deal of the yard has been ripped out and only a handful of tracks remain. What a beautiful area it's in though. All right, uh, Rodney. Yeah, that's where I'm out of uh, major. How about you, Jones? This is looking south of the exit of the yard. My guess is the track to the right is the main and the yard bypass. The facility has eight yard tracks, but I'm just not sure how busy this place is anymore. The lack of cars in the yard suggests to me there just aren't that many customers served by it anymore. But looking at the rail cars in the yard, it does look like a variety of industries use rail service in the area. There was a crew sorting a few cars during my brief visit. We'll watch them in action for just a bit.
Hey, y'all back up. Uh, we're gonna, when I finish pulling these out, we're gonna back up and start putting these in. Give Tyler some time to uh, get on up there and laying ties out.
Unfortunately, there were storm clouds brewing, so I decided to pack it up for the day. I wish I could have seen this yard in its busier days before everything was torn up. Hopefully, if I'm ever through the area again, I'll have a little bit better luck catching something. I did get a few shots of this Louisville and Nashville caboose though, it's in pretty decent condition. Now, you can also check out the old depot next to it. I didn't get a chance to go inside, but it looks pretty nice from the outside. All right, on to our last stop, Corbin, Kentucky. I've been here before, but it's just so disappointing to see a major yard like this left is just a shell of what it once was. That's an M542 you're looking at sitting there without a crew. I believe these are Herzog hoppers filled with new ballast. I'm not sure what's in the CSX cars to the left, but I've been hearing about crews putting in new ties and ballast along parts of the main line. As we look further south, there are two locomotives in front of the string of cars in the middle of your screen. Speaking of ballast and ties, we can see just how far crews have made it. The track on the right looks like it's brand new, but we can see where the old ties and ballast are left on the left. I did another signal check and once again, all red for me. I'm not sure if there just weren't any trains scheduled or if there was just track work being done somewhere that blocked traffic on this day. All this was recorded Monday, July 29th of 2024. The West Yard still has a few remnants from its L&N days. I believe this is the car repair shop. On the south entrance, we see a track mobile working with two coal cars. Here we see the old locomotive shop. You can barely spot a small yard tower behind it. This was the locomotive service center. I'm not sure if these cars are simply in storage or if they'll just never be used again. There does seem to be some activity at the site though. Those big towers were once part of the Arch Coal Company's clearing plant. A portion of that property is now used by Progress Rail for car repair. Here we see the lone turntable with no way to get to it. I'm not sure how many of these cars Progress Rail is able to repair or how high the demand is for coal cars anymore, but there sure are a lot of them stored here.
Well, one final check of the signals and an empty 542 mean it's time to head home. I hope you enjoyed seeing some of these places. These empty facilities remind me of just why it's so important to record what's still out there and in use. You never know when something could be shut down or go away for good. I've got several videos in the works that I'm excited to put together. One is a long one on road railers. Another one will focus on the Norfolk Southern Newcastle District and lastly one focused on trains from Toledo to Cincinnati. I hope you'll check out those videos when I publish them. Until our next trip, I hope you have a great day.